the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for allowing us to gather here today and to spend this time with you. Help us through this discussion and this, this time to understand more, more closely and more clearly what you've done for us and guide us in your divine providence. We trust ourselves to you and learn to love you more and more today. We ask the hands of our mother as we say, Hail Mary. We're full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brian, you said she's just about here. Okay. Um, two kind of brief notes, and we'll get started. And the first is, and it's only one page. <laughs> Um, today has been a Monday. Yes, it has. I'll agree with it, it has been one of the Mondays of all time. Yes, yeah, one of those Mondays. <laughs> you have the day off, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, and so I apologize. It's up here. It's not so on this page. My apologies. It's a very sparse outline. Um, hope I don't forget something. If I do, ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> you, you all know what I'm going to say, right? <laughs> So my apologies, I'll try to a better outline next time. It's going to happen this time. Um, and then secondly, uh, as one does, last time I was, you know, pondering over, you know, class, and did I forget anything, did I miss something? She always did. <laughs> and I realized I made a remark about Scott Hawk. I just want to clarify what I was saying. Um, and so in there, I, I had said, I was talking about, um, so, so the context was Gene Henry brought, brought the whole thing about that creation was, um, God's asked to sit in creation. And I had mentioned, kind of just said in passing, that was Scott Hahn, in his rubric of interpretation, uses the covenants. I said, I would use sharing of God's creation. That's what clarifying, I was looking at Paris out to Scott Hahn, his expertise, See someone like Scott Hahn screws with me? I'm probably wrong, go with them. <laughs> I was comparing a, a rubric for interpretation, that was it. So just so you know, I was not trying to apply, you know, and I was an expert at writing Scott Hahn. <laughs> Maybe I think that, and must be trying to apply it. <laughs> okay, so we're going to focus on Joseph today. And the story is a very long, very complicated one, so we're not going to go into it in any great detail. Um, but I do want to cover highlights. And there's lots to talk about and cover and to speak about. And again, I am not certain I'm familiar with the story. So I'm going to assume you know basically, I'm going to start talking very briefly. If there are details that you don't know or have occurred or want to go into more detail, you can go read the scriptures or I can talk a little more detail. Um, and we'll kind of break it apart and look at it. Because it covers about seven chapters. So this, this is an important moment in salvation history. This is an important moment for the Jewish people, an important moment, especially in God's providence. If I had to describe the key thing we're learning in Joseph, it's cause. God's care. And how God uses the things of the world, uses the uh, even evils, to save, to heal, to bring us back to Himself. Um, and so it's just helping us just to look at evil, look at look at suffering in the world, the whole new life. It's kind of the point, the point of the story. Um, they said it is long and involved. You can spend hours, months, and year, probably years studying just these two chapters. I want to do that. So. Just kind of, as I said, this one was a brief, quick, Reader's Digest condensed version of St. Joseph's story. But please stop if you want to go into more detail. So you have the three patriarchs. Joseph is the son of Jacob. Jacob has um, three, his 12 sons. He's three different wives. Uh, and from them, he has 12 sons. Joseph is son number 11. Um, he's the 11th son, 
I don't believe that Joseph, when Joseph's around, is that youngest has been born yet. His youngest was born after Joseph has taken away. So at this point, there's just only 11 tribes. Um, and because he has three different wives and all these kids, there are different ages. So Joseph here is a teenager when he's introduced to the scriptures. Um, I think he's 16 years old. So, 17? So it says right here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was just reading it. Sorry, I don't okay. to you. Please. He's how old? Yeah. He's 17. I don't know. 17. Um, so think of the 17 year olds you, you know and, and how. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so Joseph at this at this age, like many teenagers, probably is not always most pleasantly around. But Joseph at this point gets a dream. And Joseph's dream in this case is something he recognizes as coming from God. But it's not just a dream as that I had last night I dreamed that you know there was ant poison being spread around the property. You know, that was my dream. Um, <laughs> I don't think it was from that. Um, in wishful thinking, or maybe I ate something, but I ate, ate something too late last night. Who knows? What was it? The uh, Christmas Carol? It's more grave than Ray of Um But Joseph in dreams, he knows there's something from God. And the dream, what he sees, he sees the sun, the moon, and the stars bow down before him. And the sun, the moon, and the stars know it symbolizes his brothers and his dad. And so he tells his brothers to drink. Again, 70 years old, and I imagine this was done with great kindness and great charity. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they got mad. They get away. They're like, what do you. Stop. You know, we're bringing a bad attitude. Do the youngest. Come on, go away. So, in Jewish culture, the oldest is the one who has the authority. The oldest is the one who gets the name, has the property, gets the. And Joseph at this point is already special to his father. And especially because he is the son of Rachel. Rachel was the woman he wanted to marry. He was tricked to marry Leah. Rachel for a long time had her children, and then she has Joseph. But jo Joseph is a very dear man, very beloved. He, he's the, the son of his the, of the wife he likes best, he loves best. And so the other brothers are kind of hard to resent that thing. And at times, uh, Jacob was not very wise. He chose some special favors because of this. Um, the brothers are a little bit jealous. Um, and Joseph rebukes his son. He says, you know, what, what, are you, what are you saying? Or what are you trying to apply? The kid, shut up, basically. Um, and Joseph backs down. But he holds on to us because he says, there's something here. <coughs> and so already you, you have this idea where there is something extraordinary happening. Where there's something where God's getting involved. Where God's doing something beyond ordinary human comprehension, ordinary human plans. Because right? ordinary human plans, who is we to inherit? It would be Reuben, the oldest. But just like Jacob and Esau, Jacob and Paris, God also does something here. Look at the minute why what's going on. Um, and basically, God is overturning ordinary human conception, ordinary human act. He's, he's being, getting involved. But the brothers are jealous. And so a little while later, Joseph sent, sent out to, take, to go to this is, this is, this is his brothers, who are all shepherds, because Jacob's a shepherd, and this theme, shepherd theme. Uh, it's something that they attention to about much of the Bible. And so while he's there, the brother's like, here he comes, here, here's that dream. Here, I don't know, he's, let's go, let's go. And you have here kind of the story where you kind of see mob rule going on. Where everybody, when they're, when they're together, no one, no one wants to say the right thing. You get a couple of different people who both don't want to be involved or aren't brave enough to speak up like they should. And so Reuben, the oldest, says, eh, let's not kill him, he's our brother. Let's just get rid of him. Let's just throw him in this well and die. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> because Reuben's plan is, when everyone leaves, he says, 
<coughs> help them out, bring these different students. He's too afraid to say, no, this is our, this is our brother. He said, the secret story, say, I'm going to go secretly and rescue him. I'm going to go deliver him, bring him back to dad. You know, so at least he, his heart's in the right place, but he's a bit of a coward. Right. Okay. 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 And then a little later, Judah you know, says, well, let's not let him starve to death. Here are some slaves. Here are some slaves, Ishmaelites, who are cousins, or second cousins, three, third, fourth, 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 who are slaves. <clears throat> let's just sell them as a slave. Because it's a rubber. Yeah. Let's not kill him. That's, that's, that's too far. Let's just sell him as a slave. And so that they sell him for 20 pieces of silver. Um, and Judah, again, he's trying sort of to do the right thing. Kind of. Later on, we'll see he repents and that he does the right thing. Um, but here, you know, he's not willing to kill the brother, at least he'll be alive. Reuben comes back and he says, What, what, what happened? What happened to Joseph? He's gone. He, he had left for a bit, who knows where. While he was gone for a bit, they sell him the passing care. And they take the cloak, and they dip it in a sheep's blood, take it to their father, and say, Hey, Dad, sorry, you're. Your son has killed a lot of beasts. And Jacob believes this. He's in great mourning and in great sorrow. Joseph, meanwhile, is sold to slavery. He gets from the slave of the man in Potiphar. And Joseph actually is, is he begins to kind of up. He begins to trust us in the world. And he begins to be able to give Potiphar great advice. And Potiphar, over the few years where he's there, begins to get wealthy and rich. This is someone he trusts, someone he's able to lean upon, someone he's able to give advice from. Joseph's very prudent. But Potiphar has a nasty wife. Um, Joseph's, at this point, is a, a man. Probably Potiphar's wife is, is a lot younger than he is. In those days, it would have been common for a wealthy government official to be married to someone much younger than him. The implication, it's not said to say this, but this is my interpretation, the implication I get from this, is Potiphar is probably in his 50s, his wife's probably in her, in her 20s. You know? And so she's, but she's always a wealthy, wealthy woman, and Joseph's really cute. And so she tells Joseph, well, let's lie down together. It's the way that the euphemism that is used in the scripture. Let's lie down together. Um, and Joseph says, no. Because the betrayal of, first of all, God will also part of him. Because he's, he's loyal. He is loyal to his master. He's doing his best for the work to be where he's found. Now, part of his wife is all about all the authority. Anything she says, he's going to be believed, not Joseph. Joseph is a slave. If you're a slave, you're a master of life over life and death. And time. And part of his wife is angry and insulted that he says no. Asks him over time, and he grabs onto his shirt. He says, he, he says no, but he leaves his shirt behind him. He's, he's out of escape. And she's so angry, she screams, calls for help, and says, see, he tried to attack me, he tried to rape me, and left behind his shirt. And Potiphar and Ray throws him to prison to die. To be the rest of his life to die. So Joseph had been sold by his brothers, abandoned slavery, lied about, maligned, and cast the slave to die. And to cast the prison to die. And while he's there, this is the he throws him, yeah, everyone is, is guilty, no one cares about them, no one's wrong. While he's there, he's there in prison with two other men, the chief baker and the chief butler of Pharaoh. Butler in those days would be somebody who would carry the bottles. Uh, bottle and bottle would be the same reward. And so this would be someone who would take, give Pharaoh the wine, be a food taster, be in charge of the food stores, making sure Pharaoh got the right stuff. The baker would be the one who would make the bread, make, make the food, and make certain Pharaoh got the right things. Both are in trouble. It's not for what they did. Um, they both had a dream. Both have these dreams that are from God, don't know where it comes from, but they know it's, it's not an ordinary dream. And Joseph is able to interpret it. So Joseph has this gift and this vision where he was able to only to have dreams to explain dreams. 
And he tells the, 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 the chief baker he's going to be killed by Pharaoh, and Bobby's going to be for, uh, forgiven. This happens three days later on Pharaoh's birthday. The butler is forgiven, brought back into the service, the baker is killed. Um, but so again, it's exactly what they did, not clear why the difference is, but the presumption is the butler did a much lesser crime, maybe he spilled in Pharaoh's shoes, who knows. But the baker did something pretty grievous um, and worthy of death. Um, but Joseph says, the butler remembered me. Think about me when, when you are, are back in the Pharaoh's favor. Help me out. Give me a song. <clears throat> but the butler forgets. The Joseph again is a man. And he is left alone in the darkness and in the, the prison. And then Pharaoh has birth. And this is the famous dream where Pharaoh sees, the first of all, the seven cows. And there are seven fat cows grazing. And they're fine and healthy, and then Pharaoh's business this is great. You know, cows are going to herd. Get all kinds of stuff from cows. And then seven lean cows crawl up from the river and eat the seven fat cows. And he wakes up and what was that? And he went to sleep and he has a dream. He sees seven beautiful ears of corn. And this get wheat, probably. A corn. <laughs> corn in the. In the biblical sense, corn does not mean maize. We think of corn now. Corn by any kind of grain. Um, it's just over time now, we're looking at corn as one thing. But any kind of grain, probably wheat. Um, and so the wheat, seven ears of wheat, nice fat, full ears, and then out of the same stalk grow seven shriveled, blasted, wormy ears that destroy and pull out the other seven. And no one can tell Pharaoh what this means. But Pharaoh knows it means something. He's not thinking, that was a strange dream. You know. <laughs> but most of the time you have a dream, you think, like, cool. <laughs> Interesting. And a nice story. I wonder if I'll get to number one. I've never had a dream where God speaks. But, but this was something very clear. It was something that in the culture, the gods would speak in dreams. And so it was something that people were used to seeing. But Pharaoh sees this as a unique Special dream because the dreamers had to think about what they were. But no one can tell what it means. No one, no one can tell them what the, this dream is. And the butler says, well, there's this guy in prison. So here's Pharaoh. Here's Pharaoh. He is the king of the world, the most powerful man in the known of the world. And he's told, go to your lowest dungeon and talk to a prisoner. Pharaoh's desperate. <laughs> <laughs> Right? Most times that the Pharaoh is told talk to Pharaoh, you go, aha, yeah, okay, good, good. Thanks, no thanks. The Pharaoh knows there's something really important here. There's something really special here he must have the answer to. He's being told something by the gods. He's told something but by something divine that can do something. He's worried about it. And Joseph, when he tells him, Pharaoh knows this is what he's being told. He hears it, he knows this is right. Joseph says, it's going to be seven years of plenty. Seven fat cows, seven full years. And there's going to be seven years of famine. Which are going to be so terrible, so bad, that it's going to be as though the seven fat years weren't going to even exist. It'll be over the entire world. And Ferris goes, Great, well, that's, that's terrible. That's what we do. And Joseph says, Here's what you do. During these next seven years, begin to set aside a large amount of grain, a large amount of cheese and food and everything else. He knows in the last seven years. So plan to store for seven years. You know, plenty to store up, plenty to set aside, plenty so that when the famine comes, we'll be fine. And then set so 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 officers in charge over the grains, or over the storehouses, have been distributed slowly over the next seven years. And Pharaoh is thrilled and rejoiced. This is, this is great. This guy knows what he's talking about. This must be someone from, from God. This is someone who is not making things up. This is someone who's not asking for something. But he names Joseph, most mean the prisoner in dungeon, to being the, the, the term is, you rotted me in my chariot. In the words, you have my own authority. You're the second command after me. I give you my own ring. When you speak, it's the law I'm speaking. I'll dress you in my robes. You're going to wear a collar roll around your neck. Anything that you say, anything you charge, or what you want, you tell them to do, they must obey, it's the why we're speaking. 
And Pharaoh, remember, to Pharaoh's point of view, the people, Pharaoh's God. So Joseph was, was raised above everybody else. This is quite a job. This is quite a job. Seven years pass. So, sorry, Joseph at this point is 30 years old. He's 30 years old, um, and he is, begins to rule Egypt, basically. He's basically the ruler of Egypt. And at the age of 30. Seven years pass, exactly as he foretold. He had these beautiful, these great years of plenty, but storing up the food, preparing. So while everyone else is kind of rejoicing and relaxing, Egypt is preparing. And they're getting everything ready, they're storing up food. No one else will ever know so cool, and it's another nice year. But Joseph and the Pharaoh, they're just not. Spend these seven years preparing, and then when the famine hits, they're fine. No problem. But the entire world, which could, it's hard to know what that means, the entire world literally, or at least the Middle East, uh, there is famine. And only the Egyptians have food. And they have not only for themselves, but they sell them. So they have sort of wealth. And so Joseph has saved not just Egypt, the entire world. And Egypt will get really, really wealthy off this too. <laughs> because now they can sell the food for if they want to. But that's, that's another side. <laughs> um, Joseph's brothers come. And they haven't seen Joseph at this point for probably 50, 20 years. Um, Joseph, Joseph was 40 now. He's been, he's been in Egypt as a ruler for seven years. He's learned the language. You know, he's going to be our town. It's going to be... They, they don't recognize him. But they go up. They go up to beg for food. And Joseph recognizes them. And Joseph said that this one had a real struggle in his heart. He has absolute power. They are lonely shepherds. He is number two in the world. He could refuse them food. He could have them imprisoned for past insults. He could have them put to death, or they could try to kill him. Joseph tests them. And it's not clear that the third test what he's doing is he's not sure where they're at. He's not sure where their hearts are at. He's tests them not to be, not to be cruel, not just to play games, because he doesn't, it's not certain that they've changed with and in his, his, his mind, he's thinking to himself, if this was the same man I knew when I was 17, we can't we come close at all. We're made lost to them, it's my fault. If they've changed, the hearts are changed, maybe we can, we can come together. And the test he does, he basically sells some food to the brain, but he puts back all of their money into their, um, their, 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 their sacks and with their, with their food. And he tells them, next time you come by, I want to see, um, I'm sorry, for, sorry, first time, basically, he, he, he says, I, I think you're lying to me, I, I think, think you're villains, I'm going to keep one of your brothers here with me, and I want you to come back um, with your youngest brother, Benjamin, and uh, prove to me that you're being honest. He wants to know how they're going to respond. And then he gives them back the money. Secretly. He, he tells the, the person in charge of the food, give them back to the money. And whatever Joseph needs, he's in charge. And they give them back to the money, and they're back home. And they find that the brothers in prison, uh, probably not that's in prison, Joseph wasn't, but he's in prison. Um, and they, they find the money. And they're afraid, what, what do we do? Because now they're going to think we stole the money, now they're going to think that um, we were cheating them. I don't understand how this happened. So they're afraid to go back. They go back a second time. Because they have to. So we're going to forget about And Joseph insists they bring back their brother. The third time they bring back Benjamin finally. And, Benjamin, and, and to Benjamin, Joseph gives his own cup. He wants to have a chance to talk to him all the time. So his own personal cup. Again, to our mind, it doesn't really sound, it's not talking about like your mother and it works with his boss on. <laughs> We're talking about something that was a simple office. Something that was basic. So basically, you'd have to certain place or cultures, you have a cup there that would walk before you. And so the cup was almost like a trophy signifying who you were. 
So Joseph's cup is not a monk saying work with his boss. Think of this as a chain of office. You know, this is almost like the, the emperor's crown or something. Right, so this is, this is kind of a big deal. And so when he, when he hides his cup in his, in his little brother's bag, this is not something that can be confused. It's not something that can accidentally wander in someone's back. This is some, you know, if, if he was a thief, this would be bold beyond belief. This, this is, is a big deal. And he says, I, I want to keep Benjamin with me. I'm going to keep your brother with me because I'm not certain to whom this is. He's not quite certain where his brother is. And Judah, at this point, shows how much he's changed. He was the one who sold him the slave. He's the one who, didn't, who was agreeing to kill him. He just says, I can't, please don't take my, my brother, my lord. This is the only son, his beloved son. His older brother was killed by beasts. But maybe he's your slave instead. Basically saying, I'm going to die in place. And so Judah's willing to die in Benjamin's place for the sake of preserving their father. For the sake of the family. Recognize what he's done is wrong. This is his penance. At this point, Joseph recognizes and realizes that his brothers have changed. And he begins to weep. The first one's brothers are really confused now. You know, you know he, just made, he just made the king of Egypt cry. <laughs> What's going on? Now really in trouble. And he reveals himself to them. At first, they're more scared. Okay, now, now it is now it's Joseph. Wait a minute. He knows what we've done. We sold, we sold the slave. Last time I saw him, we sold the slave. We're going to kill him. But he forgives them. Embraces that and says, bring, bring, bring dad home. Let's, let's bring him over here. And so they become wealthy overnight. So in a nutshell, that's the story of Joseph. Let's, let's break this down. Let's break this apart. Questions or comments or concerns on this? Why did they scream at Um It is a, he, a, a Egyptian word that no one really knows what it means anymore. Okay. <laughs> um, it's, it's some kind of title of honor. Um, I've seen different interpretations, even up to the name. Again, the name, the name that Pharaoh gives him isn't clear what it means. Uh, once, one commentator said it's savior of the world, someone else said it means interpreter of dreams, someone else said it means the God of deals. Well, it was when he put him in charge, was that just so that yeah. anybody um, denounced that he wasn't in charge, that it would be a work, and then that would be the term to say? This would be more, my understanding, and I guess this is something that, that again, it's one of those words that's the moss in history. So it's, 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 it's hard to remember exactly. But something like basically saying, hear ye, hear ye, the great Lord is coming. You know, it's basically it's a trumpeter going before him, blowing before him, so people know someone really important is coming. Okay. Um, and this would have been an unusual honor. Right? So this is something that would have been like reserved for the Pharaohs. But he's a Jonathan fellow. He's Jonathan fellow, or that he's a Jonathan fellow. Right? This, <laughs> this, this is a special thing. This is something that a less Lord Lord would get. Right? So when Pharaohs are reminded of my chariot, right. he, he's giving him a special authority, a special honor, a special privilege. And so at Burke, this is a similar privilege, whatever it means. Well, it's not quite true what it means. <laughs> but it's some kind of special privilege of honor whereby people know the guy who's coming is a big honking deal. Um, so if you want to translate this big honking deal coming down the road, I mean, yeah, that, that's probably close enough. Father, there was a movie about this in Hollywood. Was there it the several. greatest yeah. story on earth or something? Which one? I don't remember which one it was. Didn't DreamWorks it was make a call to the animated yeah, version of this? Yeah, DreamWorks is yeah. It was several, called what? Right? It was called Joseph. Joseph? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I, we just saw it. So. <laughs> no, it, was, it was good. I was like, I just saw this it was really good. Yeah. Yeah. They stuck to the story. Yeah, they did. I thought they did a good job. Yes, they did an excellent job. Yeah, no, and so the older Hollywood Usually they have better jobs than they were Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They were Hollywood, probably part of first wife had a bigger role. Newer Hollywood, they wouldn't even have been there. <laughs> they would have substituted somebody else. That's right. 
Jokes don't get superpowers. Yeah. <laughs> Just so the entire thing can be shot on a three by three green screen in a closet. <laughs> right. Um, let's break this apart. Okay, so that's the main story of Joseph. Mm-hmm. What you have here is a story of a lot of ups and downs. You have a story of where in time it seems like life is hopeless. Life is broken, everything is falling apart. But, but from step, but when you step back a little bit, you can see God's hand is here. And God's hand is here to save the entire world. So you have here again the beginning where Joseph gets a dream. Joseph has this, this, this blessing from God to be able to interpret dreams, to have dreams, to see visions. Not because he's special in himself. And again, this was back to something we spoke about last time. We have here again, this, 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 the same old story. God is the one who acts first. We have to respond. We're expected to act, we're expected to um, be involved with that, we're expected to use the gifts he gives us. But God acts first. God chooses this young boy and sends to, and, and this is the one to be the one to save the entire world. And so to save the entire world, not just through power or through you know, happy ways, but through suffering. He has to suffer to get where he's going. Right? If he hadn't been in prison, he wouldn't be able to talk to the butler. If he talked to the butler, fair way to know who he was. If he hadn't been sold to slavery, he wouldn't have been in prison to talk to the butler to be fair. If he hadn't gone on the dream, those were jealous of him, they were sold to slavery. And so God is in the background moving things, arranging things, not willing to evil, but using the evil of man to do great good. God is in the background and in charge of all things, using the evil of man to arrange things in such a way that only in this way can think when things happen. So we could have that other plan that God's got, of course. But, but you look at this and see exactly how each of these steps were necessary to get Joseph to a place where he's able to be in charge of Egypt, or number two. Right. He's, he's ahead of any other, other man other than Pharaoh. How long was he in prison? It's not clear, but he would have been. So the story of being sold and being imprisoned, he was released by Pharaoh, he was 30 years old at the end. He began to be a rural boy. Uh, so probably for a few years. Uh, that's not clear exactly how many. Sometimes between 17 and, um, and, and 30. Um, he's part of for a slave, gets part of for rich, sold, and then gets put into prison. So think it would be a decade. Um, but then he gets, spends the rest of his life at the age of 30 until he dies, the old man, as wealthy and rich powers, and the friend of the pharaohs. Um, but then, all of these steps that happen in order for that, that to take place. And it takes place not only to take care of Joseph. So you have here is you have the Lord is providence to take care of Joseph. Who is a just and righteous man? But knowing as a teenager, but he grew up. He takes care of the Hebrew people. And he takes care of the world. Including the pagans. All of these under God's providence are saved. They can care of, are blessed, are sanctified, or watched over. All of these God's care of. We see then is God is not only caring about the great, big, important things. God is not only concerned with the people, only concerned with the big events. God's concerned with individuals. God's concerned with individual hurts, worries, concerns, pain, suffering. We have, we have here a God who is so great, he can save the world, but also save the individual. Where, he, he, where later on Christ will, will say, and kind of the hair of your head. 
He's not as individual as even that your hair. We're being told here again, we're being told something very important about God. We're told about God is that God is, is truly infinite and truly divine. There's several movies, several different books, several different stories, which imagine God being basically just kind of a, a great man. A good man, but a man. Um, where basically God needs to be to answer prayers. God can make mistakes. God isn't really worried about the individual, the small things, the important things. God can be, be bothered, God can be put upon, God can be annoyed because we ask too much. Um, there was, I never saw the movie, but, but Bruce Almighty, you know, where, where, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. more, more of the story, there, more of the story, there's too many prayers that I can answer them all. Yes. I was thinking of George Burns movie, but... George Burns. <laughs> <laughs> there were several, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, the, but the latest one, I think, was, was, the, was the Jim Carrey. Yeah. No, very, very silly, yeah. but very bad. Yeah. You know, being divine means you can take care of the infinite right. and the minute at the same time. And not lose anything. If, if, if God can be overcome or overpowered by a number of prayers, he's not really anything. He's not really God. As either of us falls trying as human beings, because we're used to dealing with men. Right? You don't go to Pharaoh about the problems you have in your shoes. You don't go, go to the governor because you, didn't, you don't like your, the way that the water runs. You know, you, there are a chain of command, and you have little officials with little things, and bigger officials with big things. Great men take care of great things. Little men take care of little things. You know, and that's the way the world works. But not so well. But right here being told and being shown, God can the individual. Even before with Adam and Eve, of course, you know, God's care of individuals, but it's the whole world to take care of. With Abraham, Abraham with Noah, these are these, yes, it's individuals, but it's the whole world. With Joseph, the story becomes almost intimate. You, because there are all sorts of other people around. There are all kinds of other concerns, other events, other eras, other things happening. But we see here God dealing and, and concerned with, watching over, protecting, and being with individual. And but it's different than everyone else because other other stories is almost it always in terms of the whole world. Uh, and it's it's not really this way. But you could, you could read it simply where, where God is using. It. But here it's almost more than that. Is you see, God has a personal relationship with individual people. This is something again we'll see throughout the rest of the scriptures, where it's very clear where God wants to be known and loved and understood by each of us. It's sort of being kind of this covers being peeled back. But this good God is all powerful, almighty, all good, cares about us individually. And that's a big deal. That's a big deal of something that's going to be different. Than the, the, the myths and the legends. Myths and legends are, are going to be, you know, the, the gods don't really care about people. The gods might care about nations, maybe, depending on what they're they fit. The gods might care about certain people, but, but only if they can use them. God has concerned everybody, even the lowest slave in the dungeon. God is there watching over all of our tears, all of our sorrow. And God is there working with us that way. You also have here being shown that God speaks in ways we understand. People in the same way. And among the prophets, among the saints, among God, God speaks in different ways. God adjusts Himself to us. God changes how He speaks to us depending on who we are and what we get. And to some, He'll speak in dreams. To some, there's an angel sent. To some there's a voice. To some there's some inspiration in your heart. To some he speaks face to face. But he comes and adjusts himself to us. Now that 
to be astonished. But that cannot turn into what God comes once to speak to us. God is not there saying, like, I gave you a vision, I gave you a, you know, my message, you better figure it out. <laughs> I'm only going to speak in this way because that's what I'm going to do, you all better darn it, better figure this out. God picks people, finds people, God approaches us, God speaks to us, God calls us, and there's no way we can get. Right? To Samuel, he speaks for voice. To Adam and Eve, he, he appeared. To, to Abraham, he, he came in the vision. But he came and saw us. And finally, finally, he become a man. The ultimate adjusting himself to us. The ultimate coming down to being with us, talking to us, speaking to us. So for Joseph, is a dream. For Joseph, it's a dream, and he inspires in this way. Where he understands the speaking of dreams, the speaking of places where um, ordinary life is pushed aside, and you're with God. Um, in many cultures, the dreams were seen as a place where the veil between the divine and the human is kind of spread against the very thin. Because in many kinds of places, God does speak this way. Not every dream, right? You can go too far. You know, I really don't think the dream I had where I was you know, sword fighting a monster you know, was God speaking to me. I was be fighting the devil who was telling me, you know, that. no. Um, and people ask me, Father, I had this dream, it was weird, what's it mean? We'll talk about that after. <laughs> Probably not much. <laughs> Indigestion. <laughs> you probably need to be reading something or watching something kind of similar for you to bed. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> That's good. You know, so God does himself to us. But you also have then right now this blessed. See, we have here Joseph is a virtuous man. He's chaste. Mm -hmm. He's loyal. He's honest. He never forgets God. And, and all of these things he's showing his virtue. And so Joseph doesn't attack his brothers in revenge, but very tempting. Very tempting, at least to hold over a little bit. You know. I'll forgive you, but the next month, see my toilet back there? You know, it's very tempting to hold something over their heads. He doesn't. Joseph is, is chased. Again, you have a woman there who is almost above the riches. You, you lie with me, you'll get all kinds of stuff. It would be very easy, very tempting. And Joseph says, no, no, this is a betrayal of God and my master. Where he's a slave, but he's loyal to his master. Right? And, and so even there, he, he's showing the loyalty that that's an extreme loyalty. It's he's a trouble. It doesn't change. He doesn't, doesn't bet. He's willing to suffer righteousness. Um, he's loyal to his father. He brings his father into the land and takes care of him. He's pious. He takes, he takes care of his family. Uh, he remembers God. So even as it was a wealthy, basically, second command of the king, he's always remembering God. And his last words, words to his children when he dies is, but when you remain in Egypt, when you, when you go to the promised land, take him with you. He's always thinking of the promised land, thinking of heaven, thinking of eternal life, thinking of God in the future. Uh, we hear here, there's a quote here from St. Thomas More. Who was Thomas More? Someone knows. <laughs> what was that? A theologian. Theologian without soliciting. What's he going to school? Um, Henry VIII. Henry VIII? Was that a good thing or a bad thing for, for More? <laughs> it was a bad thing. It was a Fair enough. Fair enough. That was your question, wasn't it? <laughs> So he, he, was, he was a married man, a chancellor, and he refused to acknowledge uh, the oath. Uh, he refused to acknowledge Henry VIII's adulterous unions. Uh, the still for it. We had a great movie, Man for All Seasons. I was just thinking, uh, yeah, watch that. You haven't seen it? Watched, see it. The Hall? Yeah, I think it was, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna, yeah. yeah okay. Great movie, well worth seeing. Uh, look at that. But while he was in prison, he wrote this very beautiful prayer, this lengthy prayer, uh, well worth reading. Uh, but there's a quote in here that I really like. This is this prayer. They begin the prayer by saying, Even the grace of the Lord set the world upon. He was, he was chancellor. He was a pretty powerful, wealthy man. 
before it becomes a prayer for getting faithful to God. And then basically he says, well, let, me, let me count my sufferings as a place you can come find, a place you can be with me. Uh, but he, this is where he closes the prayer. It says, For the brothers of Joseph could not have never done them so much good with their love and faith as they did to him with their malice and hatred. And he wrote this in prison for parent time. When he wrote this basically about Canada VIII. He wrote this recognizing us that God is in charge even when we feel abandoned. And Joseph recognized this. This could have been Joseph's prayer. Where Joseph was there putting himself in, in the Lord's hands. Joseph works with God. He's a righteous man. He works with God. And he works with God not just by interpreting dreams that too, not just for being faithful, just for being honest and virtuous. He works with God also in his suffering. He's willing to suffer, and through his suffering, he ends up saving the world. He becomes a type of Christ. He becomes this image and picture of Christ. Right? Christ in his suffering saves the world. Joseph in his suffering saves the world. This is what leads to him becoming the ruler and the commander and, and the one who's able to be able to collect everything and store everything. And so we see here this, this example where because of original sin, suffering still exists, and the saints through their suffering, through their, their work are going to help save the world. Suffering is not always a sign of God's disfavor. And you have a tension here in the scriptures. Because very often it was seen, because in the, 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 the book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, um, God says to the Hebrew people, if you follow me, I'll bless you. If you don't follow me, you'll be cursed. And so often it was seen at times, especially in the cultural use anyway, that if you were suffering, you were wicked. I'm a Christ, you were a leper, you were wicked. If you were blind, you were wicked, your parents were wicked. The people associated directly any suffering we have wickedness. But the scripture many times is not the case. But certainly it is the case that wickedness causes suffering. Certainly it is the case that wickedness deserves punishment. Certainly it is the case that, that sin deserves punishment and God will punish wickedness. But it's not the case that suffering equals sin. Right. And so both are not the same thing. And the tension there is to be able to understand the difference, to be able to see that at times the suffering that people undergo is salvific. So we have from the beginning of that being explained and shown. Where suffering here is, is saving. Right? The suffering of Adam and Eve is a punishment. <clears throat> the suffering of the world is a punishment. The suffering of Cain and Abel is a punishment. Joseph's suffering leads to salvation. Joseph's suffering leads to him becoming great and blessed and all. So we have here again, pointing toward the cross. Where the Lord is showing us, teaching us, beginning to reveal to us how he's going to save the world, how he's going to redeem us, how he's going to bring us to himself. So it's not a disciplinary suffering as it is a, uh, this one that's brought upon you, not that you brought it upon yourself, that's brought upon you, but most of the time when we look at suffering, we look at it as, okay, well, I did something wrong, so, like God says, you know, I did, I, I'll discipline you just like a father disciplines his child to, to correct you and get you back on the right track. But if you're not on that, off the track anyway, and you get that suffering, that's more of a blessing through suffering? Well, so, so suffering has several reasons for it. Um, this is something we talked about last class, we can go over it again. Um, no, no, you weren't here, it's fine. Um, it's a good reminder of everybody, everybody, and for myself. Um, basically, suffering has several different ideas behind it. Um, and so yes, one idea is, is punishment. And the fact is every suffering is because of suffering. Every suffering in this world happened because of sin. 
but not your, not your own sin. Not necessarily, not necessarily, but oh, like, but who of us has no sin? That's the first one. That's the first one, right? Um, so every one of us has sin. Every one of us, so every one of us deserves suffering on some level. But in the letter to the Thessalonians, I believe Paul says, I guess it's Thessalonians. Paul says, "All things work the good for those who can follow God." Um, because basically. In the end, the goal is heaven. The goal is salvation. And so suffering that I use well, that I accept from God, becomes for me um, salvation. Suffering that I reject becomes for me simply suffering. Thomas Aquinas says there's two different problems of God. Two different orders of problems, so he puts it. And he says basically that the Lord wants everyone to have the first providence, but we can let us choose the second one. God created animals, plants, the stars, for man's sake. And therefore, what happens to the plants, the stars, the animals is about us. This is why, for example, he, he lets the fig tree die. He teaches a lesson. This is why he lets the swine you know, be, be, be possessed by the demons. To show us something, to teach us something. Where our salvation, our understanding of God is more important than life of even to that swine. Which is you know, for us Nathanians people, wait a minute, is that terribly true? You know, those poor little, little pigs, you know, like, <laughs> how can they suffer? But for God's eyes, you know, us learning about him, us being saved, is worth animal suffering not. And that's why we hate that. Uh, because there are dignity to value human beings have animals on it. If I choose to live for this world only, by my sins, I reject God. I am saying to God, basically, I want to be an animal. I want to live for this life only. So what animals are. Animals are given this life. And if I'm wicked, I choose wickedness, I'm saying to God, I want to live for this life and be an animal. I don't want to be your father, I want to be your son, I want to be an animal. And Aquinas says that God will say to us, okay, I will let you be an animal. Yeah, you're blessed in this life, you're worthy of this life. But that means what happens to is not going to be for your good, but for the good of the just. And so the suffering of the damned, the suffering of those who reject God, isn't for their good, but for the good of those who are sent. Because they've chosen to reject God's first providence so they can be treated as animals. That's the Lord gives what we ask them. It's a truly scary thought. <laughs> um, um, so suffering, when it happens to people, it has several different points to it. One is a warning to ourselves and other people. The Lord is saying, come back. Right? And so e even the, uh, the, the, the baker, he is warned three days before his death. He can repent, he can call upon God, he can, he can deal with his events. You talk about this with Noah and the ark, right? The whole world is destroyed. There's 120 years before it happens, where people are told it's going to happen. And they reject it, they refuse to listen. It doesn't happen overnight. There's an ark all of a sudden, and then God says, "Ha ha, I got you good." Yeah. You know, when the Lord at times will destroy villages and towns, or the man that people destroy it, and He stops that after Christ comes. But when no testimony when He asks for those to be destroyed, it's because He basically is the one, one last chance to repent. But through calamity, through suffering, they are given the one last chance to say, "I sit." So there being so, it, it's. Their suffering is, is a call from one last call from God to come back, to change your ways. Suffering is a warning. <clears throat> suffering can be a penance. Suffering can be a punishment. Suffering can, can be a salvific. Like the, like the cross. So the Lord basically what happened, basically what I look at is this. When God created the world, he wanted us to work with him to create the world. He gave us the means to work with the great world. He gave us free will, he gave us intelligence. Tell me with, with my creation. And we added suffering and death to the world. That's how that to be. And the Lord at that point could have said to us, you idiots, go away, I'll think of this little myself. He didn't. He said, okay. We had suffering in the world, we had death in the world, okay, we're going to use this, we're going to find a way to make this work. 
And he uses them to, to become incarnate, to become man, die on the cross, and save us. So our suffering can now be a way through which, which we help create the world. Our suffering and bearing of our crosses, the united to Christ, united to God, and now can be actually truly so mythic, truly helping the world to be saved. Where suffering and death are not part of God's plan of ritual. But now, because of Christ, even suffering can be a means of salvation. It can be a place of grace, a place where we meet God, a place where we know God is, a place we come close to. Thank you for the sound of that. Look on the bright side. You just forgot your phone when you're not the guy who interpreted your dream in prison two years ago. Thank you for the question. I appreciate that. Um, it's totally too bad it wasn't like da da da. We were great. We'll be great next time we'll arrange this beforehand. There you go. <laughs> we can do that. We can be my DJ. <laughs> what? what, what? <laughs> Don't do that at the bare wall of the thing. <laughs> Grandma will get you. <laughs> she has rules, you know. <laughs> no cell phones. And we also see here then that God is not bound by us. God works things in ways that are beyond our comprehension. Right? No human being would look at this and say, I don't know how to save the world. I'm going to go let, let Joseph be a private slave. He becomes a stupid king. <coughs> Brilliant. <coughs> you know, this, that's the way we work. <coughs> but the, the Lord is, is not bound by our sins. The Lord uses the sin of Joseph's brothers, the sin of Potiphar's wife, the sin of Potiphar, which was used in wrath and judgment, um, the sin of the butlers. And if Joseph had been too early brought into the favor, Pharaoh would have talked to him. he had been set free, he said, okay, you go and go back to your people. Egypt wouldn't have had the, the food and the, the corn and the, everyone would have perished. The sin of mankind is being used by God to do good. Our own stupidity, our own suffering, our wickedness, God uses and transforms and saves. And God constantly will see the scriptures kind of up and so returns in wisdom. Right. The wisdom of man is foolish in the eyes of God. The wisdom of God is falling in the eyes of man. Right? No one would look at this and say, this sounds like a good idea. But it is. This is the wisest, greatest idea. This, this is an incredible, beautiful plan. The Lord's doing it. But it looks like foolishness. Especially in the first 15 years. But the Lord here knows what he's doing. And the Lord here, he chooses the honest, he chooses the broken, he chooses the weak, he chooses the abandoned, he chooses people, the, the, the poor fishermen. He chooses you and me. Because he is not bound by human constraints. And the thing you're being asked to look at and learn then is that God's goodness, God's greatness, God's power is not overcome by us. No too often we get stuck on us. You know, I'm too small, I'm too weak. But why do you choose her? Why do you choose him? Why fishermen? You know, why, why, why not choose emperors and kings? They would have been respected. Why not choose the wealthy people? Why, why do you choose the poor, the, the, the suffering, the stupid, the foolish? Why then? But we know why, the big picture, the time, you know, why then? Why the others? He's showing us, I'm in charge. My other, my other things, he's showing that he's in charge. We look at it, we see it's the best way, it makes the money, it's incredible. But at least we can see this, he's showing us he's in charge, he's not bound by us. And so in our own lives, we come when we face something. When, we're, when we, we're, we face the wrath of human beings. When we face a government or a nation that tells us, disobey God, or follow God. Rather than being trapped and afraid, we can say, <clears throat> I'm in charge of this. And if I do the right thing, if I speak out, I might be sent to prison. But the Lord's going to use that to be good. 
Maybe that will become the, the, the catalyst to save this nation. If I am speaking in public and I get hurt or struck or, or mocked or, or spit upon, that kind of be the means the Lord uses to save the world. And so my call then, like Job said, to be righteous no matter what, do the right thing no matter what, speak up and trust not in my own power, but in the power of the Lord of God. To see that God's there working with us, saving us, walking with us, never abandoning us. That God's care not just for big events, just for us, just for those people, but for me. In my littleness, in my foolishness, in my weakness. The Lord can use me and will do me and walk with me in these, because, and we have an even deeper promise than Joseph. That I've been baptized. I am the child of God. Keep full of communion. God in the temple of God. And so for us, we're being told and taught here, as we're everybody being given through these scriptures, trust in the Lord's power. How do you appeal? Pray, trust the world. Do the right thing. Always follow the Lord. And even if you're trapped in suffering and abandoned and alone, the Lord's there with you. There was a cardinal, um, I forget the cardinal's name, um, in Vietnam. And for 10 years, he was a prisoner. He was kept in a room small, I think it was smaller than, I think it was 10 by 10. So that's what, about from here to there to there to here? For 10 years. Solitary prisoner. And when he was released after quiet, later on, he said he did more good, good in that 10 by 10 room, praying and suffering for his people, than this time he was free of his car. Because he was able to suffer, to love, but to, to trust God. Couldn't speak, couldn't preach, couldn't, couldn't work sacraments, couldn't these things need to match. So I had more good for my people that tempted him room. Joseph did more good for the world in that little prison cell. So that's what that's really important. Um, Joseph here. No questions for one question so far? Okay. Joseph here is a type of Christ. When I say type, what am I talking about? Prototype, a model, Prototype. archetype. Which means what? An image of that uh, he's portraying Christ and how he lives his life. Yeah, you could say this is a prophecy in action. And so it's revealing to us who Christ is, showing us who Christ is, an image, a picture, an archetype, but he's a, he's a prophecy. And so his, his very life shows us who Christ is. So you understand Joseph, you understand Christ. Right, we have here again the Lord speaking to us all kinds of different ways. Where the Lord, in His beauty and mercy and goodness, is telling us, here's what I'm going to do for you. Here's what I'm going to be. Joseph, like Jesus Christ, is the beloved son of the Father. In Joseph's case, he's the beloved son of Jacob. In Christ's case, the beloved son of the Heavenly Father. Jesus Christ, Joseph was told by his brothers in the slave, in the death. They don't know what's going to happen in the slave. Right? He could be killed very easily, played out. The apostles deny Christ and sell him. The, his fellow Jews do not deny Christ and sell him the hands of the Romans. To be killed, to be put in their hands for judgment. Right? Pilate could have at that point stood up to them and said, keep it righteous, could have said, I'm not going to kill this man. He's, he's, he's not me. And he could have said, free. But he ends up killing him. Joseph's fault is the accused. He's blamed those innocent. Jesus Christ's fault is the accused, the blamed those And Joseph suffers patiently between two malefactors. Right? Joseph's case is the butler and the baker. Christ's case, he's suffering between two thieves. One thief repents and goes to heaven. One thief denies Christ and denies God, blossoms God, and is not saved. And the butler and the baker, one gets saved and redeemed, becomes restored to his position of honor, one does not. Joseph separates all. Joseph becomes the, the great 
power and rule. Jesus Christ, after the death and resurrection, death was death, rises from the dead, and exalted at the right hand of God, where he rules over heaven and earth. Joseph feeds the world. Christ feeds the world. You know, he had the 5,000 on the fish, and the 5,000, he feed the 5,000, 4,000, all the fishers. Joseph is able to store up and say, it's not multiplication, but it is foresight, miraculous foresight, to be able to save and redeem the world, be able to save and care of people. Christ feeds the 5,000, Christ gives the Eucharist. The Gentiles were looking for Joseph. The pagans, you know, take this, this little Hebrew nobody and they acknowledge him as the ruler. The Gentiles acknowledge Jesus Christ as the ruler and their king. And so do the true Jews. Uh, and Joseph forgives his brothers. Christ on the cross was calling out, Free up Father, forgive they don't know what they do. And Joseph, of course, redeemed the world through his suffering as Christ, by his passion, cross, and death, redeems the world. Joseph also is a type of, he's saying Joseph. And in two ways. First of all, he's a dream. Right? They both had dreams. Right? The, if you look at the, the Bible, Joseph says nothing, he keeps saying these are dreams. You know, he, he's the dream about taking marriage with his wife. Dream about going to Egypt. Dream about coming back to Egypt. He never says anything. He always does what the dream says. So he'll tell God, I want him to do what does it. You also have this phrase here. Start to Genesis chapter 4, verse 55, which is kind of new. Say that again. Genesis chapter 41, verse 55. throughout the land of Egypt. The people cried out to Pharaoh for bread. Pharaoh directed all the Egyptians to go to Joseph and do whatever he told them. These words echo somewhere. <laughs> so, Brother Andre would always say, referring back to this, do you know Brother Andre was, by the way? Does anyone know who Brother Andre is? No. Okay. So, Brother Andre Bisset was a 19th century, uh, he's a saint, well, Saint Andre. Was that? Uh, he was a doorkeeper of a little um, monastic order in Quebec, yeah. and his big dream was to build a church for St. Joseph. He had no money. He had, he had no, no nothing. Right. But over the course of his lifetime, he saved his pennies and built this incredible cathedral that's a huge basilica for St. Joseph. A miracle worker like Padre Pio. Uh, but his big thing was always go to Joseph. He had a problem with Joseph. Joseph will Joseph take care of him. St. Joseph. He's the father of Jesus, and he'll help you out with Joseph. He's quoting this. Right? So we, we have here with Joseph, we have to do whatever he tells you. What, what, what's Mary's last words in Scripture? Do, uh, do whatever he tells, tells you. you. Right? And so we have here this echo um, of Christ and Joseph and this reminder. Uh, That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> God is so cool. <laughs> one of these days we're just going to have to spend one of these classes just looking for all the threes. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Or, or fours or five. I mean, there's 40 days. You know, and there's so many things. Absolutely. Yeah, no, there's even the puns. You mean, we, we miss it. Here where there's so many puns. <laughs> um, especially the first, the first few books of Genesis. Um, there's some great puns about uh, earth and man and, and blood and red. Um, so in Hebrew, blood uh, is dom. I don't know I'm going to think of the Hebrew letter, I don't know how to translate it. Is dom. Adam is Adam. <laughs> Adam is also earth. And so you have things like um, the blood of your, your brother took out from the earth. It's the hadam of your brother took out from the hadam. 
The man is named Adam because he comes from Hadam. <laughs> Water is Mayim. Sky is Shamayim. So the water comes from the sky. Hamayim comes from Shamayim. <laughs> um, there's, there's a great article that, that was in uh, Crisis Magazine, if you remember the new ad a few days ago, looking at the way the word used, Noah means rest. And so in the scripture when it says the Lord's going to give you rest from all sides, but there's many pounds with Noah's name and rest and, you know, these are okay, question. Yeah. What's the Hebrew word for blue? For blue, I don't remember my head, I'm sorry. I have to look it up. I thought that the, the reason water and sky might be the same is because they're both related to blue. I don't think so, but give me one second, I'll check. <laughs> oh, gee. I don't, I don't believe that's the case. I'm just trying to think, what, what about those two things is similar enough that would make them have similar words? Well, re remember that um, God separates the waters above and the waters below. After he calls the sky, the lower he calls the sea. So I think that's the connection there. I don't believe it, it, it's a um, color. I don't think it was a color thing. I, I've heard it before, but I don't remember. I don't remember how happened what the word is. It's been a while since I looked at that, but I don't think it's related. What can I say? I couldn't get through this without my ad hoc Hebrew lessons. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the word blue is a kahol. Mm. So, I don't see a relation there, maybe there is. I have, I have a question. Yeah. I was reading some old scriptures, and they spelled Noah in a week. So does that still pronounce Noah in a lead, or no? I mean, I'm not... In the older... It confused yeah. me for a while until I realized they were talking about Noah. Right. <laughs> it was like, um, who's Noah? Who's Noah and why is he building this giant boat? <laughs> I know, that's what I got. No, stop, don't. No. <laughs> it was pronounced no. Um, the, the thing is, it's like... Is this another adding vowels to Hebrew thing? <laughs> it, it, it's more of over time how different cultures try to pronounce the name that becomes becomes common in, in, in their language. Um, so Yeshua, Joshua, the Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the Latin version of Joshua uh, because Yeshua becomes Yesu becomes Yesu becomes Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> right? So. Yeshua becomes Yesu in the uh -huh. Latin. English becomes Jesus. Okay. So that this Joshua and Jesus are the same name. Okay. Um, we're, we'll, we'll look at later on the Kappa Joshua. Uh, Joshua is the savior of the Hebrews. Mm -hmm. He's been the promised land as Joshua is the savior of the people who them in the promised land. Right. But you know, if you look at it, the English version, especially the modern English, why don't, why don't it be Joshua and Jesus? I just thought it was one of those things where God changed his name or something. But no. I'm just like... No, it's not changing the name. It, it, it's simply taking a Hebrew word and have it travel through, through Latin, through Greek, to English, to modern English. Okay. It was an old, no, no. It was an old yes. translation, so that's why I was like... Who is this no guy? How come I've never heard of no? He yep. seems really important. <laughs> so one more rabbit hole. Yeah. yeah. Put that out there. Sure. Um, back during Jesus' time, how common of a name was it? Yeah, sure. Common enough. Um, it wasn't. It wasn't rare. Um, it wasn't the most common name. Um, you, you, have two, you have two Jameses, for example, even among the apostles. Mm -hmm. um, but there, there were several Yeshua's, several, uh, um, there, there were several people that were the name. So about a few years ago when they found these boxes and they were 
Joshua's box. Or yeah. Or <laughs> Which one? <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so it, 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 it's not. First of all, that's, that pretty much has been proved proved to be a forgery, where, where a modern guy carved it. So they proved that. <laughs> the one you're talking about uh, that was proven to be carved by the guy who discovered it. So, uh, but it was a common enough name that there's going to be several tombs with the name Joshua. Um, it, it's, it's not, it wouldn't have been the top 10 baby names of the year, <laughs> but it wouldn't have been a rare name. It would, have been, it would not have been unusual. So it wasn't as common as John. <laughs> 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 nope. <laughs> uh, well, look, look at Mary. How many Marys are there? Oh, gosh. Right? Okay, so never mind. I, I have a joke to share about Kansas City. In Kansas City, okay. there are so many Marys and people with names that are variants of Mary. The joke is if you go into a Walmart in Kansas City and yell Mary, 70% of the people inside the Walmart will turn to look at you. <laughs> It's true. So just just in our church. So where's the joke again? <laughs> well, the joke is how many different ways you can find the name Mary. Just, just in our church, we had Mary, Marie, Mary Ann, Mary Lou, uh, Mara, Mara, Maria, 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 yeah, all of them, and any of them. Just, just think of one. I'm sure it was at least two. Just in the church. That's just in the in the church we were in. That's not the entire town. <laughs> Someday when you're very bored. <laughs> uh, there was a YouTube, a, a path of Lutheran pastor, Heisman Lutheran, uh, Lutheran satire. Mm -hmm. uh, and he has a little YouTube video talking about uh, the biblical conspiracy where the writers decided to write the Bible, let's make it up. And they decided, just to throw people off, everyone's going to be named Mary in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> just just to, to prove out of fallible falseness. Mm -hmm. Because something you're making it up, you don't really. Why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I grew up in a Catholic town, and in my grade, we were a small town like here, and we had one school, and there were 13 Marys in my class. Oh, okay. So, was it a Catholic we school? No. Oh. It was a Catholic town, so yes. public school was Catholic school. Yeah. yeah. But This uh, was a long time ago. Yeah. But that's so we, 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 were, we were all called like Mary A, Mary H, Mary B, whatever. <laughs> and then if there were two like Mary B's, <laughs> then you had to have your middle name added to it before. <laughs> so, uh, but there were 13 Marys in my class. Wow. A poor teacher. <laughs> no. Mary, you were there? No, not the yeah. other you were there. I'm sure there was at least one more. <laughs> we didn't have any Irish ones. <laughs> so one more thing to point out here. And this is Exodus to the Genesis slave. So during the Lord's life, was there, uh, back up, actually, there was one thing here that I want to point out. Um, it's interesting to me anyway that when it comes to choosing the Ancestor of the Messiah. To my mind, I would say, why not Reuben? Like, he's the one who's the eldest. He's the one who tried to save Joseph. He's the one who tried to get It's Judah's baby. Now, yeah, Judah has really played out his life afterwards. We did sell his brother's slave. <laughs> Wasn't he the one that came up with the idea? Yeah. <laughs> you know, now, it, was, it did save his brother from being killed. <laughs> and so again, we have here where the Lord works in mysterious ways sometimes. Um, and it, it's so it's, Judah's one is chosen to be the ancestor. Not Joseph, not Reuben, not Judah. Um, but years pass, Joseph dies, generations pass, and a new Pharaoh comes to power. And the new Pharaoh um, so we're on a new, a new line, decides that he's worried about the Hebrews because then they're not Egyptians. And so he's worried that they will take over power, we'll try to silence enemies, we'll try to, if there were political upheavals, as there were in those days, um, he might be he's worried they're going to join in someone else on the other side. So he says, let's 
very slowly enslaved. Mm -hmm. And so they begin to kind of trick them and trap them, and they become slaves. What's interesting is that in this 15, over 30 chap 35 chapters before this happens, this is already foretold to Abraham. Abraham is told us. And it doesn't chapter 15, verse 13. It's part of the covenant. The Lord says this to Abraham. This is before Abraham's name is even changed. Is he still living in Ur? No, not at this point. Not at this point. Uh, he's, 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 but so he's had the first, this, this is the midst mis of the covenant, the name hasn't changed yet. But he's, he's left already. The first thing he does, he leaves, that's, that's his first sign of evolving God. Know for certain, you can sense for his aliens and plan off their own. They shall be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. 430 years, but it's to round it up. Round it up. But, I will judge upon the nation that they serve, and after this, they'll go out with great wealth, which happens exactly. Mm -hmm. You, whoever will go to your ancestors in peace, be buried in ripe old age. In the fourth generation, your ancestors will return here. Because the wickedness of the Amorites is not yet complete. Remember, we talked about how the uh, the Lord doesn't put up with evil, and the Lord you know, will let people be they'll put to a certain point and will stop them. The Amorites later on will be kicked out, and destroyed by the, by the by the Hebrews. But first, they make way for generations, giving them one more these four generations to repent. They have these. It's time to repent, it's time to heal, it's time to come back to God. They refuse their back, but they're given this chance, this time to repent and to heal. Yet we have this reminder that God sees evil as plans for it. God knows what's going on. God is patient with us. God cares. God, God keeps count. But God is calling everyone back. But you have in the prophets of our miracles, even we don't see it. Again, to our point of view, we would say, okay, we're going to slave in Egypt. Why go to Egypt then? But let's leave before Joseph dies. You know, right? That is humanism. Mm -hmm. But God is preparing the land for them. God's preparing the place for them. God's taking God's already getting Israel ready for them. And so their time of slavery is, is getting them ready to accept his law, getting them ready to become his people, getting them long for freedom, getting them looking forward to paradise. God's working even with the evils of men. God doesn't want us to do the not, not, not planning on evil. God's not wanting it, accepting it. But God permits it. And he even uses it to save, to redeem, to heal. Like he does with Christ on the cross. So again, the story of Joseph really to me is the story of divine providence. The story of God working and God healing and God leading us in very unusual ways to our point of view. You see the big picture of, wow, that's pretty cool. That makes sense. You look at the, the first part, like, what are you doing? You know, the Lord's abandoned us. The Lord's forgot us. The Lord's re re rejected us. The Lord's there saving and healing and redeeming. Sorry. Questions? Comments? Okay. Great. Let's call it a night then. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Father. If you don't mind, I, do, I would like to read the prayer of St. Thomas. We'll read the whole thing. It's a beautiful prayer. Um, and I think it's well worth hearing the whole thing. So remember, this is something that he wrote in the margins of a book. As he was in prison in the Tower of London, get ready to die. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> Give me thy grace, the Lord, to set the world at nothing. Set my mind fast upon thee not to hang upon the blast of men's mouths. To be content to be solitary, not to walk worldly company. Little and little utterly to cast off the world. To be not mind of all of its business. Not to hear of any worldly things. The hearing of worldly drinks and meat is pleasing to me. I need to think of God. Pity to call upon him for help. Lead upon his comfort of God. This is to labor to love him. Know my own sinfulness and wretchedness. To be humble and meek under his mighty hand. To be well of my sins past. For the healing of them, patiently suffer adversity. 
gladly to bear my purgatory here, to be joyful in tribulations, to walk there with me to life, to bear the cross with Christ, to have the lasting remembrance of Him, to ever have before my eyes my death as ever at hand, to make that no stranger to me, to foresee and consider the everlasting fire of hell, to pray for pardon for the judge to come, to have always in mind the passion Christ suffered for me, for his blessings and ceasing to give him thanks. To buy the time again that I have lost before this. To abstain from vanities. To avoid light, foolish things. To avoid gladness and, and recreations unneeded. A worldly substance, life, liberty, and friends. It's all at loss and nothing, the winning of Christ. Think of my enemies as my best friends. For the brethren of Joseph and ever have done him so much good with their love and favor. And did with their malice and hatred. These, uh, these ideas were to be desired of every man, and all the treasure of all the princes and kings, Christian heathen, were gathered and laid together all upon one heap. Amen. 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 In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.